There are seven block compression formats with different usages, and all of them use an encoding that operates on a block of 4x4 pixels, hence the name block compression format. Because images that use block compression are decoded directly by the hardware, it's important to know their various properties and when to use them in order to maximize their utility. Let's have a look at the simplest encoding scheme for a block of RGB colors. The first step is to pick two main colors in such a block. I don't know exactly how these colors are determined, but that's something that the encoder does. It might, for example, pick two colors that are farthest apart from each other in RGB space. Here we can see that the two main colors are the yellow and pink colors. All other pixels in the block can be colored by using a blend between these two colors. Each one of the two main colors is then written to a 16-bit integer. Here is the first loss of quality, since we use 5 bits for red and blue channels and 6 bits for the green channel. This is less accurate compared to 8 bit per channel colors that we normally use. Here you can see the resulting RGB values for each color using 565 bit encoding. Now that we have these two endpoints, we can define two additional in between colors with equal distances. The color of each pixel is then compared to these four colors. We can use the index of the color that's closest to each pixel color for encoding. Since we have got only four colors to pick from, we only need two bits per pixel, which we can use as a palette index. Here you can see what the indices look like for each pixel. We can support transparency by using three color points instead of four whenever the start color's integer representation is less than or equal to the end color. In that case, the fourth color point represents a fully transparent black color. For more detailed information, I'd like to refer you to this excellent blog article, which also served as the source for my explanation. Please read this article to understand how transparency is encoded and how it affects color accuracy. The total size of the compressed block is the sum of two 16-bit integers used for the color endpoints, and the 2-bit indices for the 16 pixels in the block. This sums up to 8 bytes per block, or half a byte per pixel. In comparison, we would need 4 bytes per pixel for an uncompressed RGB block with alpha. So the compression ratio is 1 to 8. Not bad, eh? This is how BC1 encoding works. If we only have a grayscale image, or want to use only one channel of the image, we can use the full 8 bits for the two main colors. This leaves us with 48 bits for indices and therefore 3 bits per pixel. And because we have 3 bits, we can define a total of 8 color points instead of 4, which results in much better accuracy. Again, the size of the block is 8 bytes, while we would need 16 bytes without compression. The compression rate here is therefore 1 to 2. This is the BC4 encoding. We can also encode two independent channels, which results in 16 bytes per block. This is two-channel grayscale BC5 format. As I mentioned earlier, using transparency with BC1 format results in worse color accuracy, plus the fact that alpha is just one bit. So a pixel is either fully opaque or fully transparent, which results in ugly edges. We can get much better results by combining the opaque mode of the BC1 format for the RGB part with the high quality single channel BC4 encoding for the alpha channel. This results in 16 bytes per block and a compression rate of 1 to 4. This encoding is known as BC3 format. Now let's have a look at what we use each of these formats for. BC1 is best used for medium quality RGB textures without transparency. These are textures used for the base color of objects that are not intended for extreme close-ups. These textures don't contain a lot of variety in general, which can be encoded well enough using BC1 format. Think for example of a wall or a rock. 
This format can also be used for objects with transparency, which are far away enough to hide the rough edges. One format that I didn't mention is BC2, which is deprecated. It uses 4 bits for alpha and is not particularly useful for anything. BC3 uses the same encoding as BC1 for RGB. It doesn't use BC1's transparency mode. Instead, it uses a BC4 grayscale format for the alpha channel. Since this channel is encoded independently from the RGB channels, it can also be used for something else instead of alpha. BC4 is best used for grayscale lookup textures, like roughness, height maps, and the like. BC5 is often used for normal maps. The X and Y components are encoded independently in two grayscale channels. The Z component can be calculated in the pixel shader. With the introduction of Direct3D 11, Microsoft added support for two additional BC formats. Both of these are way more complicated to encode compared to the other formats. The first one is BC6H, which encodes half-precision floating-point RGB colors and is used mainly for high dynamic range textures with a block size of 16 bytes. Recall that BC1 had two modes for opaque and transparent encoding. BC6H has 14 modes for encoding. The last format is called BC7, which is an enhancement of BC3 format. It still uses 16 bytes per block, but because it can use two color lines instead of one, it has better color accuracy. Each block within the image can be encoded using one of the seven available compression modes. The specification of all these formats is available online, and here we can see the specs for BC6 and BC7. So if we really wanted to, we could write our own encoder, and for the most part we could manage to make it reasonably quickly. However, BC6 and BC7 formats are considerably more complicated and computationally expensive to encode. Although it would be an interesting exercise, I don't think we would gain a lot in terms of quality or performance if we would try to write such an encoder ourselves. Therefore, I think it's more productive to use DirectX text library for encoding BC formats as well. However, before doing that, I'd like to give a brief explanation of sRGB color space. Let's have a look at linear colors first. For this, we look at the intensity or a power output of a pixel as a function of the RGB input value. In order to keep it simple, just imagine a white color where RG and B components are equal with values between 0 and 1. When we increase the RGB value, the pixel intensity also increases. Furthermore, if the RGB value increases by a certain factor, let's say twice as much, then the pixel will also emit twice as much light. This is the linear relationship between the RGB value and the pixel's intensity. Until the first few years of this century, digital images were mainly displayed on cathode ray tube monitors, or CRT for short, and for those of you who are too young to know what I'm talking about, they looked something like this. These magical devices emitted light by shooting electrons onto a phosphorus layer on the screen. However, in case of CRT monitors, increasing the RGB value didn't result in a linear increase in the intensity of the pixels. It turned out that they were a bit lazy and didn't want to emit light as much as was desired by the RGB value. As you can see here, the intensity hardly increased for lower RGB values. That means that a value of 0.5 didn't result in 50% intensity. Measuring the increase in intensity revealed an exponential relationship instead of a linear one, where the intensity is a function of RGB value to the power of some constant we call gamma. Here we can see what happens if we use different values for gamma. When gamma equals 1, we regain the linear relationship. However, for CRT monitors, the gamma value was typically around 2.3. We would then adjust or calibrate the monitor for a gamma value of 2.2. Now the problem is that if you display images in linear color space on a CRT monitor, 
they would be noticeably darker because of this nonlinear behavior. The solution to this is to save the image using the inverse of this exponent. So if we calculate the color of each pixel in the image using the inverse of gamma, we get a curve that increases more rapidly for smaller RGB values. Using this gamma corrected image on CRT monitors would cancel out the gamma exponent and we would end up with a linear image again. In 1996, Hewlett-Packard and Microsoft introduced the sRGB color space, which is almost the same as the Gamma 2.2 color space. The main difference is that it's linear for small RGB values. The exponential part uses a Gamma value of 2.4, but if we plot this curve, we see that it closely matches the Gamma 2.2 curve. Here we see that it's slightly darker for the smaller RGB values, whereas it's just a bit brighter for larger values. Please read this article from Tom Forsyth about sRGB colors. Here we can also see the colors displayed side by side, where the left column displays linear colors, sRGB in the middle one, and gamma 2.2 in the third column. I'm not sure if you can see this on your monitor, but I can see that sRGB is lighter for lower RGB values and a bit brighter for higher values. This is the exact opposite of what we'd expect from these curves, and that's because we are visualizing the sRGB to linear curves, which we see here. We can display the linear to sRGB curves, like so. As expected, the linear color now looks too dark, and we can see that sRGB is a bit brighter than gamma 2.2, but it's really hard to see the difference for lower RGB values. Anyway, this is how the values are converted back and forth between linear RGB and sRGB. One thing that I also need to mention is that most of us don't use CRT monitors anymore. However, modern flat panel displays don't intrinsically have the nonlinear intensity behavior of CRTs. They artificially match their output to the gamma curve, which can be calibrated to a value of 2.2, and that's how we can still use sRGB colors. Okay, so now we have textures in sRGB color space. How do we actually work with those textures? Well, let's have a look at texture categories. Not all textures contain color data. In fact, most texture types contain data that we use for calculations rather than for colors. For example, normal maps are not color textures. Although they can be displayed as colored images, they actually contain object space normal vectors. It's recommended to always save images that are used for color textures using sRGB color space, but we must never save data textures using sRGB. Remember that the distribution of values is nonlinear for sRGB and that would at the very least mess up the precision of the data for different value ranges. When doing calculations that involve colors, it's most important that we always use linear RGB colors. In order to do so, the sampled sRGB texture values should be converted to linear space and whenever we output pixels to an sRGB render target, we need to transform them back to sRGB. Fortunately, sampling from sRGB textures automatically returns the linear RGB values. In the same way, writing to an sRGB texture will convert the linear value to sRGB colors. Therefore, we don't have to do any of these conversions ourselves. In addition, no conversion will happen when sampling linear RGB textures. So when we sample our normal maps, for example, we get the exact value that's in the texture, which is what we want. I hope this video clarified the sRGB curve as well as block compression formats. Please let me know in the comments what you thought of my explanation of these topics. In the next video, we are going to use DirectX text library to compress our textures. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. 
If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!